Hello everyone, my name is Brant Kudrowski and this Organic Chemistry Lab video covers a Grignard reaction experiment. This is part 3, Reaction with CO2, Workup, and Characterization. In the previous video in the sequence, I talked about formation of the Grignard reagent, phenyl magnesium bromide. Now, I have a flask with phenyl magnesium bromide dissolved in ether. Next, I'll add this solution to solid CO2, dry ice, and the Grignard reagent will attack the carbon of the CO2 and form a new carbon-carbon bond to make a magnesium carboxylate salt of benzoic acid. This bucket contains solid CO2, or dry ice, which is very cold, so I'm wearing thermal gloves here to protect my hands. I'm taking a 125 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask and I'm filling it about a quarter full with dry ice. Because it's cold, dry ice has a tendency to accumulate frost, so it's a good idea to dispense it just before you're going to use it. Now I'm disassembling the reaction apparatus, taking apart the various pieces to get to the flask with the Grignard reagent solution in it. Next I'll add the Grignard reagent to the solid CO2. This process generates a lot of CO2 gas, which you can see flowing out of the flask here. There are chunks of magnesium left over from the Grignard formation reaction, and I'm pouring such that I leave those behind in the round bottom flask. I don't want to put them in with the CO2. The reaction is a thick, gooey, gurgling blob at this point. To make the reaction mixture easier to handle, I'm going to be diluting it out with some ether. I'll measure out 10 milliliters of anhydrous ether and add it to the reaction mixture, and I'll swirl it around. The bubbling is caused by carbon dioxide subliming, going from the solid phase to the gas phase. That bubbling will continue until all the CO2 is gone. At this point, the Grignard reaction is over with. The Grignard reagent, phenyl magnesium bromide, has reacted with CO2 to give a benzoate carboxylate salt. Now the reaction mixture is still really cold and there's still a lot of residual carbon dioxide. I'll take care of both problems by placing the reaction mixture in a room temperature water bath. This will warm up the reaction and accelerate the sublimation of CO2, converting it from a solid to a gas. Once the bubbling has stopped, I'll know I'm done with this step. Now there's a gooey tan blob at the bottom of the flask. That's the product at its current state. It's difficult to work with like this, so in the next step I'll add sulfuric acid, H2SO4, and water to protonate this carboxylate salt and make it neutral, which will allow me to work with it more easily. Here I'm adding 12 milliliters of 6 molar aqueous H2SO4, sulfuric acid, and water. It starts off as a milky white mixture, but as I swirl it, that'll give way to two clear phases, an organic phase and a water phase. Now I'll pour that two-phase mixture into a separatory funnel so I can separate those layers. There's a lot of white residue on this Erlenmeyer flask. That's actually benzoic acid product, and to try to recover that, I'm going to rinse this flask with some ether. I'll measure out 8 milliliters of ether, then I'll use that ether to rinse the Erlenmeyer flask in two portions. Two small rinses is more effective than one large one, and does a better job of transferring the benzoic acid from the Erlenmeyer flask to the separatory funnel. Now I'll cap the separatory funnel and shake it, making sure that I invert and vent regularly to release any pressure. And then I'll put it back in its stand and allow the phases to separate. There should be two phases in the separatory funnel, but occasionally people will see a third phase. If this happens, just add 10 milliliters of water, shake, and it'll become a two-phase mixture. The upper phase is the organic phase. It contains the solvent ether along with the product benzoic acid in its neutral state. There's also an impurity called biphenyl that's present. This formed when the Grignard reagent was forming in the very first step when we put the magnesium in with bromobenzene. Then it's also possible there could be some unreacted bromobenzene in that organic layer as well if the Grignard formation reaction didn't go to completion. So the desired product, benzoic acid, is present in the organic layer, but it's not pure. The lower layer is the aqueous layer, the water layer, and it contains magnesium salts. Now I'll drain the aqueous layer out the bottom and discard it. That'll leave the organic layer in the separatory funnel, which contains the desired benzoic acid along with the organic soluble impurities. Keeping the layers straight in this experiment is a particular challenge, so to make sure I don't make a mistake and throw away the wrong layer, I'm going to label this container as aqueous waste. To separate benzoic acid from the other organic impurities, I'm going to be extracting it using 5% aqueous NaOH, sodium hydroxide. I'm measuring out 8 milliliters of this solution, which I'll add to the separatory funnel, and then shake. 
Sodium hydroxide is a base that will deprotonate benzoic acid, making it into a much more polar sodium salt so it'll migrate out of the organic layer, away from the organic impurities, and into the water layer. Then, when I separate the layers, I'll separate the compounds. Benzoic acid used to be present in the organic layer along with the biphenyl and the bromobenzene. However, when we put the aqueous solution of sodium hydroxide in, it got deprotonated, which made it into a much more polar salt, so it migrates into the water layer. Now the salt of the product has separated from the organic impurities, and I'll separate them when I separate the layers. This is my first extraction of the ether layer with aqueous sodium hydroxide. It will get most of the benzoic acid product deprotonated as sodium benzoate, but I want to repeat the process a couple of more times just to ensure that I get a better yield. So here I'm measuring out another 8 milliliters of the 5% NaOH, and I'll put that in the separatory funnel, shake it, allow the layers to separate, and then drain the lower aqueous layer, and combine it with the aqueous layer from the previous extraction. Then I'll repeat that extraction one more time for a total of three extractions with eight milliliters of sodium hydroxide solution each. Now it's time to protonate sodium benzoate to recover benzoic acid as a neutral solid. To do this, I'll add a magnetic stir bar, I'll put it on a stir plate, and then I'll add six molar aqueous hydrochloric acid to acidify it. I'll get the solution stirring and add the aqueous HCl by a pipette, adding about a pipette full at a time. As I'm adding, you can see that there's a white precipitate that forms. It's first a cloudiness that dissipates pretty quickly, but as I add more HCl, that's going to persist and end up forming a white solid. What's happening here is that sodium benzoate is getting protonated to form a neutral benzoic acid, which is water insoluble and precipitates out. As the solution gets more acidic, more of the benzoic acid precipitates out. At a pH of 2 or less, it will essentially be all protonated. To test that, I'm going to use pH paper. I'll touch a glass rod to the solution and then touch that to the pH paper and read the scale on the container. This looks like about a pH of 3 or so, which is acidic but not acidic enough. I'll add some more hydrochloric acid and retest. Now I have a really heavy precipitate in the flask, which is good because it means I have a lot of benzoic acid to filter. Now when I test the pH of the solution, it turns a bright red, and from the scale on the container, I can see that's a pH of either 0 or 1, which is sufficiently acidic. Now I'll be vacuum filtering the product to remove it from the water. I'll turn on a water aspirator, get my Buchner funnel, add a piece of filter paper to it, put it back on the filter flask, and wet it with a little bit of water to seat the filter paper against the holes in the Buchner funnel. Now I'm filtering my benzoic acid product. I'll rinse the Erlenmeyer flask with some deionized water to try to get more of the benzoic acid transferred into the Buchner funnel. Here's a close-up view of the product in the Buchner funnel. It's a white powder, but it's still wet with water. Ideally, it should be completely dry before you attempt to get a mass on it and a melting point. The best case scenario is to let it dry in your drawer over a week and then take the melting point the following week. If you can't do that, then pull a vacuum over the product like this for about 15 minutes or so to get it as dry as possible. If there's any water left over, that'll act as an impurity and depress your melting point and probably broaden its range. Now I'll get the mass of my dried benzoic acid product. Now I'll prepare a sample for melting point analysis. I'll take one of these melting point capillary tubes and stick the open end into the sample to ram it into the melting point tube. Then I'll turn it over and tap it on the bench to force the sample down into the closed end. To make the process go faster, I'll bounce the melting point capillary through this glass tube on the bench to pack the sample down. Here I'm showing a video of the melting point analysis. This is sped up a bit for the purposes of this video. In real time it's going much slower than this, rising at a rate of 1 to 2 degrees per minute. Remember to record the melting point as a range, recording the first temperature when you see the first drop of liquid and the last temperature when you see the last bit of solid liquefy.
Finally, I'm preparing a sample for infrared spectroscopy IR analysis here. I'm taking a little bit of a solid and putting it in a test tube, and then I'll add a little bit of ether to make a solution. Now I'm pipetting that solution into a well on an ATR crystal plate. And I'll evaporate the ether solvent using a gentle stream of air. This leaves a white residue of benzoic acid in close contact with the crystal plate, which will give a good IR spectrum. Now I'm placing the crystal plate on the IR spectrometer on the ATR accessory. Then I'll go to the Omnic software and hit collect sample, and the collection starts. Here's a high resolution IR spectrum of benzoic acid that you can use in your lab assignment. This concludes the video series on the Grignard reaction experiment. Stay tuned for other organic chemistry lab experiments that will be covered on my YouTube channel. If you found this video useful, check out the next one in the series or watch the prior video, and consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. My name is Brant Kudrowski. Thanks for watching.